Okay, so that was the Renaissance. Now we're going to go to the Elizabethan era. Uh, this was actually, of course, named after Elizabeth I, Queen of England. 1500 to 1600 approximately. It's obviously in England, and they had advancements in drama, literature, and music. And I propose that this was due to extra omega 3s. Okay, so if we go back and we look at the omega 3s, you see they're important in, for treating, preventing depression, but they're also important for something called sequential memory. Okay, sequential memory is the ability to remember things in a sequence, which is things like a storyline, right, or just a, a song, music. So that's why they're important for, for, and for language, of course. Language, music, literature. To remember all this, maybe some of you played in a band and you had to memorize the music, right? Wouldn't it have been nice to have known this back then? So uh, now, it's not an increase in global intelligence, but we see it in increase, an increase in music, drama, and literature. Okay, things that use sequence memory, sequence processing. Okay, and again, it's important, just like calling during pregnancy and infancy. So, how do we know? What was going on here in Elizabethan England? Well, the English and the Spanish were going to fight, and we had the Elizabethan English going up against the Spanish Empire at the time with Philip II. Okay, the cause of all this was actually Henry VIII. Uh, he had uh, annulled the marriage with Catherine of Aragon, who was Philip II's great aunt. And on top of that, to get to do that, he um, repudiated the Catholic Church in England and created their own religion and made himself the head of it. Okay, So the Church of England, uh, so basically he pretty much you know, really antagonized Philip, the Catholic Church. Okay, So what he also did was he um, banned fish days because they were viewed as a Catholic tradition, so he was trying to move away from Catholicism. And of course, the fish are the source of omega-3s, so uh, we don't see, you know, this is a timeline of, of um, literature, literary artists coming out, and we see during his reign, not much was happening, right? Not too many artists, so he, he did a pretty smart move there, right? Actually. But when he was gone, there was a, the next king that uh, they realized they were going to have to fight the Spanish because of what Henry had done. The Spanish were going to invade. 1563. Uh, no, he's going to come in down here in 1548, uh, about that time. So they realized they were going to have to fight the Spanish. So what they did was a very smart move. They came back with two fish days. They were going to make the people eat fish twice a week. The logic behind this is they knew they were going to have to fight the Spanish at sea because the only way to get to England is with a navy, right? So they were going to have to fight the Spanish at sea, and they were going to need ships and sailors. Now, the ships they could build you know, and hold. The sailors, they needed to be trained, and then they needed to be kept around, which was expensive. So what they did instead was they said, let's make the people eat fish, creating this demand for fish, which will then require uh, to supply this is we're going to need more sailors to man these fishing vessels to bring the fish. So they would created a supply or, or a quantity of sailors without actually having to pay for it, which was a pretty intelligent move, don't you think? Does that make sense? Does everybody follow that? Okay, so Edward was replaced by Elizabeth, and I guess they felt they just didn't have enough sailors, so they came out with three fish days, or third fish day. Right? <laughs> now, that's force feeding your people, right? Making them eat fish three times a week. And imagine the omega 3s coming into their diet. So, it's the only source of omega 3, is it? What's that? It's the only source of omega 3. Uh, Aren't there other sources? We'll talk about that in, in, a, in a few slides down the line. So here they are eating all this fish and getting all this omega-3. And of course, fish too is also has other nutrients. It's not just omega-3s. But what we have is the emergence of the two, believed to be the two greatest dramatists in English literature, Christopher Marlowe and William Shakespeare, the year after this 
this uh, change in diet. They're followed by a lot of other uh, <coughs> literary artists. Okay. The, Eng the Spanish were defeated in 1588. Okay. Uh, with the defeat of the Spanish, there was no longer any need for the fish days. Oh, and okay. it was viewed, people started thinking, well, isn't this just a Catholic tradition? Why are we eating fish three times a week? And uh, on top of that, why be made to eat fish mm -hmm. three times a week, right? So the tradition slowly fell away as I asked a university professor what happened. He said, probably fell away because they just, there was no need for it anymore. Fell away, and then we had this uh, sort of a drop in liter literary artists being born. Okay, go ahead. It seems to me sure. uh, that you're giving an awful lot of credit to a national government in being able to plan this far in advance. Yeah. Uh, that, well, we know we're going to need to defeat the Spanish at sea at some point in the future. And I, I, that's, that's a supposition. I'm not sure that that was expected. I right. mean, it could have been a land war. Uh, well, yes. I mean, I, I, it seems to me you're giving a lot of cre more credit to a, a government in the 16th century than we would ever give to a government in the 21st century. Yeah, okay. Well, to answer that, I didn't make that up. I did the research and pulled this out of the research. The other thing was, in the meantime, the English were supporting the Dutch who were rebelling in the yes. Netherlands trying to break away, right? So there was an antagonism going on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? And the, um, there, were, there, were, there was this general antagonism. So, but to go back, I didn't make that up about them planning these fish No, but, but I mean, you could make, you could, is it possible? Because we're all, we're just talking about correlation here. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it a possible mm -hmm. that in order to feed the population that uh, uh, fish, fisheries were a more efficient way to feed the population than, say, uh, grain production uh, domestically within uh, Yes. Within okay. Let, well, let me answer that. Say they are, right? Then that means that fish would cost less than grain. And well, not cost less than, but I mean, uh, not on a pound for pound basis, surely, but uh, it, it'd, be an, it'd be an element of that. Okay. Well, then, but that would there would be a supply and demand. Right. The, but the English, to the best of my knowledge, weren't necessarily looking after the national diet, concerned about the people. Right. Why would you Why would you impose three fish days on people? Why would you impose that? Right. If you just repudiated the Catholic Church and you're trying to get rid of Catholic traditions, then you come back and say, no, we're going to. We're going to go with this. So the, the, what you're saying is the national government was effective in saying you, the unwashed gentry, if you will, must eat fish three times a day, and people conform to that. Uh, three times a week. So, uh, pardon me, three right. times a week, and they, can, <laughs> and they can they conform to this to a certain extent, right? Not everybody conformed, obviously. Uh, one person I read said, "Well, they probably ate more beans than they ate fish." You, it was like it was a meatless day. You're not supposed to eat meat. So the idea is you're going to eat fish. Um, there must be some societies around where people eat even more fish than just three times a day, like some island cultures, for instance. Mm -hmm. Why haven't we seen any Shakespeare's among others? Well, the other, that's a very good question. The other thing is you actually need a population. Okay, You need probably, I don't know how many, but you need a million or more people Right, to have something come out like that. If you have a few hundred thousand, you're not going to see it. If going back to atherosclerosis for a moment, there are some island nations with tremendously low atherosclerosis, <coughs> but there's some with tremendously high atherosclerosis, and they eat the same thing. And there's just so few people that it's not a good statistical model. And the same thing applies to: um, Are you going to get a literary genius coming out? which actually makes the Florentine Renaissance exceptional because Tuscany only had like 100,000 people. The population was only, uh, Florence only had 100,000 people, not Tuscany. Tuscany was something like a million. But, so that's why that was actually a very exceptional time. But very good question. 
Any more questions on this? I'll keep going. I guess I have one question. Sure. Two fish and three fish a day, or I mean, a week. Uh, three fish days, two fish days a week. That's well documented. Yes. Yes. The, the other could be open. This gentleman raised might have some. Well, other I don't factors, but those are. I'll have to say I I read a book on this um, and the end. Of, there, the, I presume the author did his research, and it was it's documented. Something like that would be documented. It's you know, a government decree where everybody's going to, or actually a church decree. So temporality and precedence. It seems to be that we have uh, literature booming when we have omega threes, and it doesn't boom until we get the omega threes, and it goes away when the omega threes go away. It would be nice if we could look at dose. There may be an ability to see, <clears throat> like when Henry VIII banned the fish days, no literature. Uh, with two days, we had a little more. With three days, we appear to have a lot more. But we'd have to go back and look at it <clears throat> more closely. And I don't have the time. <laughs> I have a question. What about on fish? Do all fish uh, provide these omega uh, threes? Or is we'll, type we'll come to that. Yeah, we'll come to that in one slide. <laughs> So if we go beyond the Elizabethan era, okay, after that, remember it dropped, but then it came back. And what we have is we have this new trawler invented, and in the 1800s, it was more efficient. You could get a lot more fish. We had railroads hooking up the nation, just like we're talking about the French. And then we motorized the trawlers in 1875, right? All these three came together to create the national snack, <laughs> fish and chips. Okay. So, uh, what do we see? Uh, we see Victorian novelists happening, coming out during this era. Charles Dickens, Bronte Sisters, Thomas Hardy. Okay. Now, we do have a technology, which the steam press, printing press, which reduced the cost of books, so they could get a lot more books out cheaper. But, Nonetheless, for something long and complex like that, you do need an audience, right? They have to be able to read it and keep it in their mind. They have the audience has to have the sequence memory too. Okay. They have to know how to read. They do have to. You know, <laughs> I forgot to mention that. <laughs> now let's look at music. Music is interesting, and I'm comparing the English and the Italian because <clears throat> they have similar populations, similar size. And we have, uh, in the Renaissance, we see that the, the, red, the English composers, and these are classical composers, which compose music with the music notation we know today. Right? These are classical composers. Did I, I need some water. No. These are classical composers. And in the Renaissance, that's when we had the fish days, and there was plenty of classical composers. After that, it dropped and during the Baroque because, of course, they stopped the fish days, whereas the Italian composers kept going. Now, some of this was church supported, right? So it wasn't just, as we know, classical composers today, which are free agents. Now, then it, it dropped off and it comes back in the modern and contemporary era. Okay, so what we have there is again the effect I propose of the fish and chips being supplied to the diet. Where were the uh, Northern European and German composers during this time? How would you have, how would you yeah, have looked at that? Thank you. That, I try to look at that and there's not, I don't have good data on that. Now the German composers, <coughs> I, I don't understand, right? They have, well, there it's a huge nation, there was an empire, actually the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and so they were pulling people from all over. And well, it, I'm thinking of Beethoven, Brahms, exactly. Mozart. Exactly, right. I, and people have asked me that, and I don't know. I, I, it would take quite a bit of effort to go in and look and see what happened there. Okay. Uh, so, I'm my proposing that the fish and chips cause this boom in the in the modern era. Okay. In but during the Baroque period is when we got three fish days. Uh, no, no, it ended. It ended. <coughs> it, uh, we got three fish days during the Renaissance period. Baroque, 1600. 
it ended. Okay, so there was a, an interesting anomaly. Sometimes we see the cause and an effect, and one was wartime rationing. So wartime rationing, you've got a reduction in the food supply, except the fish was not rationed. Okay. However, however, fish supplies actually dropped because they couldn't go out and fish or and the ships getting blown up, right? So fish supplies actually dropped. So there were long lines uh, and at the fish and chip shops. So um, if you remember pregnant women need it, so, you know, during pregnancy. So what's the chances of a pregnant woman standing in line, a long line, to get fish and chips if she's hungry? Probably not much. But that's what husbands are for, right? So I'm proposing that they had their husbands stand in line. So what would we see, right, in the, if we had this cause in the 1940s, when would we see the effect? When is the effect going to happen? When are we going to see the effect? 20 years. 20 years later. We're going to see it a generation later. A generation later is the 1960s, right? What did we have in the 60s? Right? The British invasion. We have a huge number of British music artists coming out. Right? I won't go through all of them, obviously. Re still relevant today. In fact, some are still playing today. The Rolling Stones, still playing today. Uh, the Beatles, very relevant. And then all these others, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with these people, right? But there was a reduction in fish supplies. There was a reduction, right. And that is a confounding variable, right? So that is a confounding. There was a reduction that fish, you could eat fish, it wasn't rationed, but there was a reduction. So you have to ask, did pregnant women, because if they were willing to stand in line or have somebody stand in line, did they get more fish? What would have been their accessibility to cod liver oil? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Oh. But that's because a, that was so ubiquitous. That is, that is an excellent question, and we're going to see, well, I'll tell you right now. So cod liver oil is high in three nutrients, omega-3s, vitamin D, okay, and vitamin A, and I th right now we've s we've seen that we have right now omega threes are all the rage, <coughs> or have been for a while. Vitamin D, is that right? So what about vitamin A? What do you think? Well, your body stores it, so maybe you don't need it. Okay. okay. Well, we'll talk about it. We'll see if we need it and if we actually have a deficiency in a in one a future class. Okay. But the lack of cod liver oil, I think, is a significant effect, cause, actually. I, mean, I think we're seeing the effects. So those are good questions. And this is not a clear, right, clear cause. And Well, the effect's clear, but we don't know if the cause is clear. Okay? I missed something. The lack of cod liver oil had what effect? Uh, well, it, it would reduce vitamin A, D, and omega-3s. Cod liver oil had all of that. Cod liver oil has all of that. Right. And we've sort of stopped giving it. We used to give it to kids religiously. I and now we've stopped. Said I What's that? My father used to give it to me. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's go on. There's a few other notables. Alfred oh. Hitchcock, uh, the director, voted recently. Most influential film director by the Film Directors Organization, right? That's quite an endorsement. British, born in 1898. Harry Potter, you guys know these seven books. Imagine the sequence memory to keep all that <laughs> in order, right? Uh, and Downton Abbey, right? Drama, again, British drama. So, but now there's a, something going on here. Um, we have fish and chips which I'm proposing are behind all this music, literature, and drama, right, have been replaced as the national snack by chicken tiki masala, which, which has no omega-3. So what does that mean? There's no omega-3. Watch out, 20 years. Yeah. That means the end for <laughs> British drama. 
Isn't that a sweepy general fishing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is dramatic, right? I mean, there's there's got to be so by now in a in a, in a diet, there's got to be so many different sources of so many different nutrients. But what you're saying is the preference is it's not the availability; it's the preference. Uh, yes. I mean, it's not. I'm sure that if you wanted to, you could. Be a wash in omega threes if, if you if you wanted to you could go wash and and, <laughs> and it and it may be and and you're right and it may be that as most of us now take omega three supplements right that we actually don't need to even eat fish for that from that aspect okay was the fish fried on fish and chips fish and chips is fried so yes the frying is Pretty soon, um, we pretty soon well, find that all the frying, frying oil is good for you. It, it will be. Uh, yeah, it's on. It's on. There's a comeback on that. Okay, but thanks for your comment. That's very good. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the where these omega threes are, and DHA is the one that's important for the brain. Okay. So what we have is, of course, in the the oils, it's really high because it's, it is oil. Um, we have the cold water fish are high in it. As you see, the anchovy is actually kind of high in omega 3s. Now, notice um, we have lamb brain and pork brain. I threw those in there just to let you know where it is in the body. We're eating it because it needs to go to our brain. We have, notice that cod is actually not that high in omega 3s. Okay? It's right above tilapia, which is a warm water fish. So maybe you, to get the effect with something with so, such low omega-3s, you had to force feed it to the birds, right? Uh, by the way, chicken egg is, uh, has some omega DHA in it, okay, which is interesting. And then actually quinoa actually has some DHA in it, which is actually exceptional. It's, a, you know, because DHA and, and EPA, the other omega-3, is produced by algae in cold water. Uh, and it's basically their antifreeze. Cell walls are fluid, so they don't freeze, congeal, and die at cold temperature. So it makes sense that quinoa, which is grown in alpine regions up in the mountains regions, would have, also have a similar, um, use the same thing as its antifreeze. Now, the, the reason this is exceptional is because before now, we've only thought that DHA was synthesized by marine plants. And this is the first case of a, a, a terrestrial plant that produced DHA. That's pretty exceptional. Go ahead. Um, I know for a fact that certain companies who shall be go on, on name are working hard to develop DHA in canola. In what? Canola. Canola. Okay. So you can see that added to the list. Okay. You mean well, GMO introduction? Yep. Okay. So no, don't get me started on that. <laughs> so I think this is a big opportunity. We were talking about yeah. lamb's quarter last last yeah. uh, week and the ability to hybridize quinoa with lamb's quarter, grow it here in North Carolina where we grow tobacco. Uh, it would be a big opportunity to produce DHA as uh, in a seed like that. Are we going to be talking about krill oil as a source of omega threes? That's that's kind of current. Uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, but I think it's you know about it, right? Mm -hmm. I I don't want to get into the finer aspects of which oil is better, right? No. Well, it's a it's, it's a hot one right now. Right. Why do you think it's better, or why do you well, think it's better? It's just out there. It's just it's just out there and more sustainable because they eat such tiny little. Organisms that, that we're not going to be depleting our fish stocks. I guess that's maybe why it's up there, but it's also up there because pharmaceutical company is pressing it. Is that why it's up there? Well, <laughs> that's that's my uh, skeptical thought. On right, it. right. As I was speaking at the beginning, uh, whenever something is presented as good for you, see who's who's saying it, and do they have do they have an agenda with it? Okay. Tell me again what you mix quinoa with 
Uh, well, you would hybridize it with, with a plant it? called lamb's quarter. Lamb's quarter. Which okay. is a weed. The lamb's it's a weed around here. We treat okay. it as a weed, okay. but it is edible, okay. and it's related to quinoa. Okay. Okay. Now, the only problem with DHA and omega 3s in general is they have this anticoagulant property. So if you're taking an anticoagulant, you have to uh, talk to your doctor about changing your the level in your diet. Uh, so let's move from the Elizabethan era to the Dutch uh, Golden Age. And the Dutch Golden Age was the 17th century, most of the 1600s. And they have, and we'll see, it started slightly before. We had, uh, they were preeminent in trade and uh, naval power their, and their art and science. They were really, it's exceptional because they were a small, very small nation that had just gotten their independence and suddenly they became the greatest trading empire and also naval power in the world, which that's incredible, right? So there was, it wasn't just food alone. Of course, there was technology with this. They had uh, cheap energy. They came up with the windmill, and they had a lot of peat. They also developed a new ship. They, they abandoned the old method of creating a ship that was dual use, warship, trading ship. Right? They just made built a trader, carried twice the cargo, uh, cheaper to build, less crew to manage. So you could really get your trading costs down. And they were able to mass produce these because they had sawmills powered by the windmills. And so they could mass produce these things. So with that, they basically took over the trade because it, they could just get the cost down. One of the things that they were trading was herring. And so with these cheap costs, they were able to pull in herring from the North Sea. So if we go back and look at herring, you see that it's actually a lot higher in omega in DHA than the cod. So they didn't have to be force fed it, right? It was you could eat it once a week and get the equivalent of eating a cod. So one point two is okay versus when we're talking eighteen. Why would you bother with something in a point oh six? Uh that's a good question. You wouldn't eat chicken eggs for the for the omega threes. But I did put it in there because to let you know that there was some in there. Right. And speaking of chicken eggs, uh, something we were looking up uh, is in chicken skin. And I noticed we always had pulled the skin off even now. It's you pull the skin off before you even cook the chicken. Mm -hmm. And then like with fried chicken, uh, you notice everybody pulls off the outer layer of the fat skin. I do I like the skin. <laughs> what? I like the skin. No, but if, what is, I forgot the nutrients. It's one of your charts uh, uh, about the glycine. chicken skin. Glycine. 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 Yeah. Right. So now we're all going to be going back and eating chicken skin. <laughs> <laughs> well, aren't chicken wings popular as a dish? Yeah, but I even take the skin off of them. Wow. Well, why do you even eat the wing? I mean, there's nothing on there but skin. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's other issues related to how the chicken is is raised as well as far as chemicals and the like, where they tend to um, segregate as well, come into play in all this. Um, a different subjects. So that's a different subject, right? And also, what you feed them can, can probably influence what's the. Well, we know what you feed them can influence the nutrient content of the egg, right? We know that. So you feed them certain things, you get a more nutritious egg. Uh, but I just wanted to put this up here to show you where herring, how herring was so much higher in omega threes than the uh, <coughs> cod. Okay. So now the other thing they had going was they had religious tolerance. Um, they had broken away from the Catholic Church, right? And they had this religious tolerance. So people, for example, Protestants from other areas, Sephardi Jews from Spain, and even later the Huguenots from France came to this area, and they were skilled laborers, right? So they had this influx of uh, skilled people, intelligent skilled people. And one last thing, which I think is very important, they reclaimed the uh, wetlands and turned it into pasture and produced uh, dairy products from that, cows grazing. 
they produce so much dairy that they actually call their nation the New Canaan, as in the land of milk and honey. So we see that cheese shows up in a lot of their paintings. And cheese, again, is a source of calcium, tryptophan, vitamin B12, and vitamin A. OK, so I'll just talk briefly about calcium. Um, I've broken the food groups up into what, to me, seem to make more sense. I think the pyramid as we have it now, with just a few food groups, is too simple. Uh, this is more complicated, but I think it shows very clearly uh, the differences in foods. Now we see the cheeses over here under dairy are really high and that's the actually the mozzarella and the aged cheese. Cheese produced the old-fashioned way with just the enzyme that cleaves it. Cheeses produced by adding acid to them, these are acid set cheeses. That's like if you've ever added, mistakenly added lemon juice to your tea with milk in it or something like that. I did it as a kid. but. <laughs> If you add acid to milk, it will coagulate, okay? And then you can filter it out. And that's when you get cottage cheese, cream cheese, and things like ricotta with that, okay? So these fresh cheeses that are low fat, they, they're actually also low calcium, okay? So you look elsewhere, nothing else comes close. Well, tofu actually is pretty good, and it's made by precipitating the soy proteins with calcium. That's why it has so much calcium, okay. But the Dutch didn't have tofu. They had cheese and then, so they had this enormous amount of calcium coming into their diet. And as you probably know, uh, calcium is important, so important to the body that the body regulates the amount very closely. And you can't just take a blood test and see if you have low or high calcium like we can for like vitamin D. Because the body is absorbing it from the bone, resorbing it from the bone. So as you're probably well aware, we pay for the deficient for the calcium deficiency later in life. We do. Okay. So it's a it's an important nutrient. Um, but I wanted to move on. Uh, by the way, this is that still life uh, with fruits, nuts, and cheese, right? Which is what I asked you guys to eat last time, right? So I think this is the Van Dyke breakfast. <laughs> modified, modified with mozzarella. There's wine on the table, too. Is that? Not, not red wine. White it's, wine. It's white wine. OK. We know well, I didn't, well, if you want to have white wine for breakfast, <laughs> have, a, have a mimosa or something like that. But the reason I put this up is that I wanted to go back to serotonin synthesis, which needs seven, remember this needs seven nutrients at least for it to be produced in sufficient quality, quantity. And these foods provide uh, most of those. Um, the, one, the only one that's missing from this picture is actually folate. Uh, it's, another, other foods provide this. But if this is, the, if this is what the Dutch were eating, they're getting a pretty good uh, supply of nutrients for serotonin synthesis. Okay, so serotonin, what's it good for, right? What's it good for? A good feeling. A good feeling, right. Well, for satiety, okay, if, if our brain is, fit, is well supplied with serotonin, we don't get hungry. Now, it's not the only thing. We do have hunger, it can be caused by other things, but that's, we need to have high serotonin. It's also for prosocial behaviors, which like grooming, okay. Uh, so have you ever seen a, an antisocial hairdresser? <laughs> <laughs> serotonin reduces antisocial behaviors such as aggression, right, and social isolation. So I don't know, hairdressers, I guess they're attracted to the profession. They must have high serotonin. <laughs> I'm just putting these things in as uh, the ways to help you remember some of these features, right? Now, high serotonin is also important. It leads you to assertiveness. These behaviors, assertiveness, empathy, self-confidence, alliance forming, and motivation. Now, motivation is a psychological word, and we probably understand it more as industriousness. You're just up and working all the time. 
Now the interesting thing about these is that they're actually good for business. Okay, so if we have these behaviors like assertive, assertiveness, empathy, and happiness, they map very closely to what uh, negotiation coaches tell you you need to be a good negotiator. For example, assertiveness is don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Empathy is seek to understand. If you can understand the person you're negotiating with, you can make them an offer, well, that they can't refuse or that they find very appealing, and maybe you don't have to put as much money on the table to make the deal, okay? Happiness, well, they say to be optimistic. I mean, why go and negotiate if you're pessimistic, right? Why are you even in business if you're pessimistic? Um, so I propose that high serotonin is, leads to more business deals, which leads to more prosperity. Does that make sense? Okay. Isn't that so, like Did they what? Okay. Isn't that the facial arms like Trump? <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's <laughs> Um, so the, the Dutch, they had all this technology, they had the fish, and they also had this big source of, of cheese, which were motivated them. I believe there's an expression, the industrious Dutchman. Um, they created this trading empire, which basically spanned the world. They, they had the Dutch East India and the West East India companies trading around the world. And they made a phenomenal amount of money. and. Uh, they were very prosperous. Now, what's exceptional about it is that there was only like 1.5 million Dutch people. And in relation to France and Spain and, and Great Britain, which were their, their big rivals, they were a very small country, yet they were able to control this huge empire. Eventually, the others caught up, right, as it always happens. Okay, so. Let's go back to where does serotonin come from again. It comes from tryptophan. So tryptophan in the brain is converted, it's converted into serotonin. It has to get into the brain to do that. And it's the ha serotonin, as you mentioned, was the happiness hormone. And But serotonin is converted into melatonin, which is the sleep hormone, which may explain to some extent why, what's your name? May explain to some she extent such a good night's sleep. why you got such yeah. a good night's sleep, yes, right? Gene. Gene, it may explain to to a certain extent why you got such a good night's sleep. And in fact, um, I have seen and tried this various people, uh, not necessarily mozzarella, but by changing something the diet, you can actually um, it treat insomnia by working on this pathway. Um, so. Let's look real quick. This is where it gets a little bit complicated, but uh, I'm going to take my time and you guys ask me so we understand. Okay. So you've got the blood-brain barrier, and tryptophan has to get across that to get into the brain. And it's a very um, selective barrier. The, we, the body does just not want to let anything into the brain. Right? We, there's a lot of toxins running around. It wants to, it wants to control that very well. So it has one portal for 10 amino acids, this group of 10 amino acids, which, of which tryptophan is one of them. So we have tryptophan and nine other amino acids which are jostling with each other to get into the brain through this one gate, okay? So that's what it looks like. <laughs> trying to get in. Imagine trying to get through this crowd to get down that street, right, if that's the portal. You know, it depends. If there's like 10 people on the street, you can do it easily. But if there's one and there's 100 others, it's a little more difficult. So to measure this, um, I came up with what's called the tryptophan rating. Okay, it's, all it is is the odds ratio, which is uh, the ratio of tryptophan, okay, to the competitors. And that gives us this fraction, which is kind of difficult to deal with. So I just multiplied it by 100, OK? So as we have fewer and fewer competitors, we have a higher tryptophan rating. 
it's sort of like the octane rating on gasoline. The higher the octane rating, <coughs> the better the fuel. If you have a low octane rating or a low tryptophan rating, the engine knocks, we get depression, right? So at the other end, we get happiness and uh, motivation and all those behaviors that are high serotonin, pro-social behaviors, okay? Okay, so let's take this tryptophan rating and go look at some foods, okay? So if we look at using this tryptophan rating, if we look at it, uh, the foods we see, there's chia is high and mozzarella is high. And mozzarella, there's, in Italy, there's only one type of mozzarella, but here we have several because I don't know why. But we have the fresh stuff and then we have the stuff that's aged, uh, it looks like it's aged, and there's, all, there's about four or five types. And um, the, it, depending on the type, the tryptophan rating is either like mozzarella or lower, right? So you have to look in the book uh, and you'll see I've done the calculations for each yeah, you one. you want to have skim milk rather than low milk. Low moisture part skim. Oh, let me go back. Again, the kids will eat what tastes best and they know what's most, what taste is an indicator of the nutrition. So, and they're not pretentious, so they'll eat what's best. So eat what they're eating. If they're eating that string cheese, right? Yeah. And that's good. That's a good one. Um, the other thing is interesting is that there's a mozzarella substitute, which they, I guess they put it on pizza or something. So uh, I think this is why some pizza, pizza tastes better than others, right? They use, you know, the wrong mozzarella. So, so we look at whole wheat is relatively high, <clears throat> tofu, quinoa, fish and meats, and then we have aged cheese, which is, spans fish and meats. And mozzarella over time ages and loses tryptophan. And the reason is the molds that are growing in there are consuming some of it, transforming it into other products. Just like we transform tryptophan into serotonin, when there's an excess of tryptophan, the bacteria will transform it into some other amino acid that they need or some other substance. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned mozzarella and string cheese are, are, can be high. Now, if we go and we make these diet cheeses, as they're called, the acid set cheese, that reduces the tryptophan. The tryptophan apparently stays in the way. Okay. Now, if we throw bacteria in there and let them uh, have their way with milk, uh, we get yogurt. And they, of course, are consuming it, tryptophan and consuming it a lot faster. So you're left with a very low tryptophan product. Okay. Egg whites, by the way, if you stopped eating the yolk and ate the white, the white is not very high tryptophan. Um, and the yolk was where the nutrients is that we've been talking about, choline. Was the tryptophan in the milk originally? And that's yes. Get concentrated? Right. Oh, okay. Actually, uh, yes. That's, that's where it is. In the whole milk, would it be equivalent to what you see in diet cheeses? Uh, no, in the whole milk, it's, it's higher. It's, it's actually, higher. It's, it's higher in whole milk. Okay, yeah. okay. But it stays in the way. Right. So it starts in the cow. That's where milk starts, yes. That's where the tryptophan starts. Yes, <laughs> right. It starts there and, and then over time, as we throw or as we let bacteria or molds consume it, they slowly lower, they chew up some of the tryptophan. Okay. And those hunts that went across Asia and ate forced yogurt, the people that... The, that the Mongols? The Mongols. Yes. That they didn't You've read the, the book. Nutrients. You've read the book, so, haven't you? So the horses don't produce the same as cows? Uh, they used horse milk for their yogurt? Is that what you're asking? I thought that's what you told that's me. That's right, right. So they well, didn't have the cow? They didn't have the cows, but it, I think the, what we see is that regardless of where the milk came from, if you throw a microorganism in there, it's going to consume certain amino acids, that are, anything that's in excess. For example, it's going to, tryptophan is in excess, it's going to consume it. Okay. 
So where is drinking a glass of whole milk relative to the cheese? Um, it's that's a uh, it's somewhere in the middle. Okay. Whole milk is somewhere in the middle. Sure. I was curious after I left uh, the other day about why mozzarella. Why mozzarella? So I went home and I put it in the computer and I got. I don't want to be an expert on mozzarella, but it it, um, it was interesting that and the aged cheese brings it up that mozzarella is a fresh cheese. Right. So fresh cheese doesn't do what you were just talking about. It doesn't have all the uh, uh, time and assimilation of other uh, or the uh, symbiosis, whatever it takes place inside the cheese that the aged cheese does. That's correct. So it's a fresher cheese, but it also because it contains red, I thought, well, what's the difference between paneer and mozzarella? Or, mm -hmm. or, or, uh, or cottage or cheese. Fresh cheese, in the case of Frisio, things like that. But mozzarella contains rennet. And rennet brings enzymes to it. Rennet is an enzyme. That's the enzyme that cleaves the milk proteins. And it cleaves them and they coagulate. Yeah. OK. Uh, and and that's how we are able to filter it out by that. But I'm not big on mozzarella because it doesn't have much flavor. No, I've never liked it. And, right. Uh, but I bought some. I, bought, I tried to get good mozzarella and uh, I've been playing with it. It's, Put, I'm okay. Good with anchovies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good salt, on. the salt that you make. Like. Yeah. So what oh, happened? What cottage cheese? That's just what I was going to that's, that's a diet cheese. That's an acid set cheese where they they take the milk and they dump in like citric acid or even acetic acid and the 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 proteins coagulate and you filter it out like but, that. But wouldn't that be the concentrated stuff? No? Because uh, when you cleave it's when you cleave that protein you um, Part of it remains behind in the way, and this is a, this is, and you'll see the part that remains behind in the way is actually a low tryptophan part. So if you coagulate it, you're pulling it all down, and it's actually it turns out to be a, a, the ratio is a low tryptophan. And those fresh acid cheeses do not have rennet. They do not have. That's right, but the rennet has no nutritional value. It's just an enzyme. It's just an enzyme that we put in. Yes. I, I didn't fully understand. So, when does the tryptophan get concentrated in the whey, or it just breaks down? Um, in, in so, that if when you when you throw in the rennet to cleave the enzyme, yeah. right, the tryptophan stays with the coagu coagulated protein, right, the stuff that turns solid, not in the whey. So. I don't know if I put this in there, but that's a good question. That way, you can get two types of way. Okay, so you can get an acid way, which is made, it's the byproduct of making these acid set cheeses, cottage cheese, etc. You can get this way, and it's actually high tryptophan. Tryptophan is as high as mozzarella cheese. Now, a friend of mine said she used to go as a girl to drink the water, the way that was they loved it because obviously it was high tryptophan but it was also high magnesium which they neutralized it with so so it gave her diarrhea but nonetheless i guess it was worth the trade-off evaporated milk take the water away to have all the stuff right well yeah but then you'd get something that's less than mozzarella see the mozzarella is concentrating the tryptophan it's concentrating it in a way because it's there's two steps. One, you're cleaving the protein, okay? You're separating the protein into different parts. And you're concentrating the good part that that is high tryptophan. So without the cleaving, you don't have the tryptophan. It's concentrated as into part of a, a right. molecule? As part, right, exactly. Okay. Right. Okay. Mozzarella well, is fermented, is that right? No. 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 Not yet. It will. It eventually becomes fermented into aged cheese. It's fresh. Fresh, what you say. Right. Fresh cottage rennet. Cottage cheese is fresh. Cottage cheese is fresh. But there are two different types ways of making those. One you make with an enzyme, the old-fashioned way, and one you make with acid. 
citric acid, acetic acid. Okay? And you get two different products from that. Any other questions? What happens to the enzyme? Uh, well, it, it eventually degrades. The microbes probably chew it up too. But the body needs lots of enzymes, so we can't use those enzymes? Well, it's a very specific enzyme for digesting cheese. Right. So uh, let's look then if we believe that the Dutch had all these prosocial behaviors, let's look at their art and see if we see some of that uh, serotonin coming through. So uh, this is a scene. You guys know this one? It's at the North Carolina Museum of Art, right? So what they do is they, they uh, uh, this is a, not something I came up with, but the Dutch painters tried to pull you in as bystanders, right, to these scenes of intense emotion, OK? And in this one, we're pulled in because that guy that's getting his tooth pulled, he's looking right at us, right? He's looking at us. And you notice that <clears throat> each of these three characters has a different type of emotion going on, right? So I think that was a really maybe the quintessential painting to show that how the Dutch can could uh, show emotion in their paintings. And to show it, you have to understand it, right? And you have to feel it. And you have to want to express it. OK? Yep. I'm just looking at the, the woman's left hand. Yeah. It seems a little out of joint. It seems, it seems a little out of joint. It, it seems like her, um, her, it's too low for her, right? It's like she has a very long upper arm to me. It looks me. like she's got two thumbs. It yeah. looks like she has a very long arm. That's what she looks like. So maybe they were good at empathy, but less at human, <laughs> human anatomy. <laughs> okay, that's a good observation. Um, this one again is at the North Carolina Museum of Art. If you're in there, stop in and, and take a look at it. Okay, so this one is Jesus and the apostles on the Sea of Galilee. There's a huge storm, of course. Um, and this one it, it is by Rembrandt. And this is what somebody said about Rembrandt. One of the greatest prophets of civilization because of his empathy. Okay. And this is Kenneth Clark, famous uh, documentarian. Right. So I think you know, this is more supportive of the case that these people had a lot of empathy back then. Now, empathy is not sympathy. Okay. Empathy is understanding. Sympathy is pity. Okay. What's well, supposed to be missing today? Empathy. Yeah. Empathy. And well, maybe we've been shifted down the curve from mozzarella to yogurt. Maybe we can. <laughs> maybe we can shift back up the curve. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so what about music? Well, they had a problem in that the Calvinist religion didn't like organized music, except in church. <coughs> right. So. You know how difficult it is to maintain an a symphony? Um, back in the Great Recession here, a lot of symphonies went under. The states could not support them. It's an expensive endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's no symph symphony, why would there be classical composers composing music? There's, there's no. But what we do know is that they, uh, ex they really like to sing, apparently. Um, this is a statement where um, I'll give you the reference here. This is a statement where basically they didn't have all these classical music, but they really loved to sing. And in fact, we see it in this, in this painting. Um, why, in fact, would you paint this scene if it wasn't you know, happening and um, if people wouldn't find pleasure in it, right? OK. so. That's from the music point of view. From the literature point of view, um, I'm not a great scholar of Dutch literature. And I think one of the problems is that there was like, it's a, only 1.5 million people speak the language. So you're not going to get the diffusion through Europe. It's not a, one of the classical 
Italian, French, or English, or Spanish, so um, they had a problem there. Nonetheless, we do have some statements about these people. Uh, P.C. Hooft as a historian, maybe one of the greatest in Europe, they say. Bradero was uh, the great, greatest comic dramatist produced, and he was uh, lived during this age. And Van den Vondel um, was the best known of all Dutch writers. These are all guys that came up. And this is due, of course, again, uh, supported by the omega threes from the from the herring. Okay. So remember, we have like seven nutrients for seven for serotonin. Does that bring anything to mind? It should bring up. The seven deadly sins, right? <laughs> no, I would. I didn't think. No, no. You didn't think of that? No. Yeah. no. Well, okay. So this guy Yanka put together this this correlation he feels that we have. We're now able to treat various symptoms with SSRIs. In fact, we can treat a lot of them. And so he said they're so common, and uh, the treatments are so common that. What if they actually corresponded to these behaviors which we call sin? For example, depression as sloth, right? I think that's a very easy one. Before we are actually clinically depressed, we actually have low motivation. We just don't want to get out of bed. It's not like everything is blue, but I just don't want to do anything today, right? And so that's, that's sloth. Aggression, that's the antisocial behavior. That corresponds to wrath. Eating disorders, if serotonin is responsible for satiety and you have low serotonin, then you're going to want to eat more. Remember, um, uh, sexual disturbances, social phobia as far as pride, obsessive compulsive, and paranoid jealousy. Let me talk about paranoid jealousy real quick. It's, you know, it, he, he says it's greed. So um, it makes sense in that if you, like, Greed being, I want more, right? Why is that not? Why do you want more? Because you actually want it, right? You want that thing, whether it's money, whether it's I want all the business around here, uh, things like that. So it does. I think it does correspond. An interesting one is pride, which I didn't really understand until I was reading this, and I, I was, uh, I didn't. But when I he explained it as a social phobia. It made sense. That is, um, if you're too proud to apologize, right? for example, why, why can't you apologize? Because you're afraid of the social ramifications of an apology, right? It's a social phobia, right? OK, so um, nice thing about this is you now are in a good position to when you get onto the next life and they say, hey, it's judgment time. What's up with lying in bed all the time, right? Why didn't you do anything? So, serotonin. <laughs> okay. On the other hand, now that you know, you've got no excuse. <laughs> or you just say aged cheese. <laughs> it was, I was eating the aged cheese and not the mozzarella. Right? Or you could, well, okay. Um, now here's a painting by Peter Bruegel, who was a Dutch painter, and this is the Tower of Babylon. Okay. Tower of Babel. 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 Sorry, Tower, Tower of Babel in Babylon. <laughs> and Dante says that this was pride. What do you guys think? Because they wouldn't speak to each other. I know they all spoke a different language. But more. they were building this. Yes. Why would they no, build this? To, to get closer to God. And they right. spoke all the same language. Right. That's why yeah. they were able to do it. Right. But what is the factor? Why were they? Building this tower to get close to God is it? Is they were, that they were trying to become godlike? They were. Is that pride? I, I would say that quality. Arrogance. That's arrogance. Okay. Show that they were better than others. That they were better than other people. Show that they were better than other people. But how is that different than piety? I, I think. I think in this case it was, uh, if I remember, that they were trying to become God. They were, they were, they're trying to be God. I, I think they were trying to reach heaven, reach heaven, right? To become like God. Yeah. Right? Maybe the leaders had construction contracts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah. What was the well, I don't know. Have you studied I, Calvinism? Um, what's that? Have you studied Calvinism? 
Oh, it was well, a religious yeah. theology complex. That <laughs> you guys are on to why they. Now you're you're on to why it fell apart with the multiple languages. They had contractors from all over come in, right? And they all spoke different languages, no, and they no, couldn't no, get no, the no. thing finished. They all no. spoke the same language. That's how they could build it. That's how they started it. Right, and and God said struck it down and forced them all to speak different languages. Well, and that's why we call, right. call those call it Babylon. Right. No, that's that's what that's the story that's written. Right. Right. Um, oh, that's not the real story. That's not the real story. Come on. Uh, no, that is the story. That's, <laughs> the story. that's the story that's written. Uh, why it they fell into different languages, I don't know. Maybe there's reasons because God said so. Maybe, Maybe because God said so. But why did they build it, right? That's that Dante says it was pride. That is is that a social phobia to want to be like God? Is that a social phobia? I don't know. That's not a social phobia, right? I think to be, well, I mean, we're going to get the philosophy here in a real hurry. Do you want to go down this road? Well, I'll just, I'll just spit out what I, I think. I think it just shows motivation, right? Now, why would somebody build a tower? Well, they have various reasons for building it, but the ability to build this huge tower, right? That shows motivation. Now, we can say, uh, why something happened, but what is I'm trying to get at is what was the stimulus to build this thing and what enabled it, right? This is, goes back, now this is ancient Babylon, and they had a new diet too, which we'll talk about in a future class. Uh, having uh, had some uh, commercial real estate experience, uh, I believe that uh, a great motivator for commercial uh, to build large projects is the uh, desire for immortality for it, to, uh, to establish yourself as being building something that will be there long after you are. Uh-huh. Okay. You, was that, you think that's a social phobia? May, I think you may be on. Oh, I, that's not that right. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That is, you want to be... It's not the healthiest of motivations, but it's certainly a, a motivation all of us have, the right. desire to... Uh, to leave a heritage right. is a, is okay. a noble, noble form of that rather than a, right. a perverted form. And maybe, maybe you're right that the guy who was behind this, the prime mover, was going to put his name on it and it was going to be him. Right. Trump, 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 Trump Tower. Trump Tower. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, if, right. if he didn't have something like that, he could put his name on a 747. If he didn't have something like that. 747 aircraft, he could put his name on the side of that. You know, we got tired of doing those things. Right. Uh -huh. Well, let's. So okay. where are we going with this? We're going on. We're just moving on. That's where we're going. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, so the plasma or blood plasma has is high tryptophan. So what the body has to do, it's got to shift all these foods up. Okay, and it can do it. It does it. Uh, it's got a couple of ways to do it. The most obvious is like, well, let's. Um, with exercise, we're going to, um, these are the amino acids. Let's burn up amino acids because the body does burn amino acids when it's exercising. The muscles do, okay? So uh, exercise will sort of like trim things down. And if there's a lot of something in there, like a lot of these competitors, actually like there's a lot of valine, a lot of leucine, it Sorry, will... Uh, these are the sorry. These are the competitors, the amino acids that compete for what? with tryptophan to get into the brain. But it's is this a good the concentration question. in plasma. Is that this is the concentration in plasma, right? Oh, okay. So, some of the foods have much higher con concentrations of the of these competitors. So the body has to has to consume them, and it does it with exercise. Okay, it's got to get rid of them. It either, you either exercise or it also can convert them to fat. That's not yep. easier. That's not, that is easier. Yeah, I think it is. But exercise is a good way to do it. We want to do it, I think, that way. Okay? So exercise actually makes us happier. Okay? Is, is, but it, but is, is the decomposition, are you saying the decomposition of some of the others is preferential to tryptophan? Or if I exercise and reduce them all by five, your ratio doesn't change. That's right. 
and it is it is preferential. For example, phenylalanine, um, the tr the transporter, it's got a similar portal in the muscles to the brain, except the affinity for certain of these is much higher in the muscle. For example, phenylalanine, it's either 100, somewhere estimated between 100 to 1,000 times higher affinity in the muscle. It's more likely that, in other words, the muscles will attract a lot of phenylalanine to burn. Are you familiar with phenylketonuria? Oh, you are? You are? Oh. Right. So that's a, that is a problem if you can't get rid of phenylalanine, you have you get brain damage and you have to be on a special diet. So the muscles are really designed to especially get rid of phenylalanine and the other ones as we'll see in just a minute. But, but the muscles, I mean in exercise, aren't the muscles using these amino acids to produce more muscle tissue? I mean muscle tissue is protein. Not necessarily. If you're, they can do it, they do it for that, but they also burn amino acids as fuel. Amino acids are converted into fat. They're actually they're converted into a small first they're converted into small ketones which are burned. Eventually if they're not burned they're they're linked in into fatty acids. Okay, so the body's got this system, and this is one way to adjust the tryptophan ratio in the blood. That's why exercise is really important, right? Okay, let me just kind of conclude this. It burns the amino acids up, but and not all at the same rate. That's right. And how do I know the tryptophan is not being burnt more than the rest? I mean, uh, I'm going to do all that exercise and lose the tryptophan. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, the, it's designed that way. It's, what? It's designed, the muscles are designed that way. Okay, so let me, I'll, let me finish and then you'll see. We'll do a summary as to why it's designed that way. So now, you know how you feel happy after you've exercised nice, strenuous, exercise. It's a runner's high. Well, they used to believe it was endorphins, but they've come realized, they've done the research, it's not endorphins. Mm. And I propose it's actually just a serotonin. We boosted their serotonin in our diet, in our brain, right? Okay. So um, now when you boost it, serotonin, remember we're going to go back, uh, keep you guys from hurting yourself. <laughs> Too much serotonin it leads to prodigality, okay? So prodigality being impulsive spending and impulsive sex, right? So the, you probably all remember the story of the prodigal son, took all his money and went and spent it on women, right? That's the story of the prodigal son. And the Dutch actually liked that story a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot of paintings about that, uh, both the before and after, which we'll see. So. We now, here in the U.S., have had our own experience, I think, with something that we call irrational exuberance, <laughs> right? Which um, is impulsive investing, I believe. And the Dutch had the first, actually the first financial bubble was the tulip mania, first recorded financial bubble was the tulip mania, right? Um, so that's the problem with our society. With our society? Yeah. With our financial market, there's too much tryptophan in Wall Street. Uh, there could be. I think there's. I don't know if they have too much tryptophan or or we have too much, right? You're, you know the expression of the book about Prozac Nation, um, where we really boost. We can really boost our tryptophan, our serotonin, um, and consequently we have these behaviors that come with what about it. Hoarding. Hoarding. Would that be? Don't you think that's uh, paranoid jealousy? Or is that now? May, that may not be paranoid jealousy. I don't know. I don't I know. It might be impulsive spending. Well, they they are actually uh, hoarding would be impulsive spending. Uh, depends on what you're hoarding. You know, if you're hoarding bread bags, right? That's yeah. I don't think that's impulsive spending. Um, let's go on. Okay. So the other thing is, we have these three amino acids which are special. These three competitors, which when we take in carbs. Uh, it signals the muscle to suck these in and burn them. Okay, these are called branch chain amino acids. And these are what weightlifters want because if you're building muscle, you want to uh, suck those in, right? And build the muscle. So, but if you're not building muscle, if you're just exercising, then 
you're going to even more preferentially burn the competitors, right, to tryptophan. Okay. Is, is it, I presume there's data of yep. somebody before exercising, and if you plot these various uh, amino acids, and then they exercise for an hour and they took a blood sample. Yes. And analyze the beginning and see yes. the disparity that we're talking right. about. Right, yes. Yes, and what I think is going on is that this ratio has been overlooked in a lot of different places. It's been overlooked. Why, I don't know, but um, maybe it's higher math. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when to eat curves? Eat, that, in fact, if you go and physical trainers and physical training books say, eat a small uh, snack before you work out. Eat a small carb snack before you work out and you stimulate the muscles to pull in these three amino acids and burn it, right? Um, so I want to leave you with the last story uh, done with the Dutch. Um, I'm going to leave you with the two paintings by Rembrandt. These are the prodigal son, the before, before scene. He's in the brothel living it up and the after scene, right? where he's begging for forgiveness, okay? Would you take this to heart for a week? Take this what? To heart for a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't head it to any brothels, but. <laughs> okay, so, um, if you guys feel like adding to your lab, if you wanna feel like adding to the lab, um, do at least one serving of rice. Oh dear. And getting rid of white rice. Right. Just, but let me say this. Okay. You don't have to do this forever. It's just a week or two. Two weeks would be best. Daily. Uh, right. One serving daily. And a serving would be, you know, depending on how much you eat, what you would consider a serving. Okay. Now, I know some of you, and we all know now because of our discussion, that white rice has arsenic. Now, don't, uh, I think that it's okay for a couple of weeks to eat it, after a couple of weeks. This is for breakfast? No, no, you can eat this whenever you want, oh, during, the during the day. Anytime during the day. Right? It has to be white. Well, you can have brown if you'd like, mm -hmm. but brown sort of adds a confounding variable, and it adds a bunch of nutrients, so it's already confounding as it is. <laughs> What's the benefit of this? What's the what? What's the benefit going to be? It's a secret. Oh. I can't tell you. So there are two. Who wants to make this a, a blind test? I'm trying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So basmati and jasmine and white rice do not have as high glycemic index as as the other one. Plain white rice. Choose either 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 one you want. Okay. Right? Okay.